So as we said, we're going to move through the past the seven material in order. We're going to cover almost every chapter that you read in this class that we have going. And of course, you're going to get most of your knowledge and most of your preparation from taking what we're doing here and then applying it to the practice questions, what we call exam cram. But let's start with economic factors. Inflation, deflation. How important is this to your investor? It often depends on where they are in their life cycle. For example, <clears throat> if you're starting up a 529 savings plan for a baby or a one-year-old kid, we know that not only will the general level of inflation be a problem over the next 16 to 20 years, but that college tuition tends to rise even faster than just overall inflation. And so when you're trying to build up a nest egg for a goal that's pretty far down the road, you need to be very concerned about inflation. And the way that you deal with it is to be in the stock market. If you looked at that 529 plan with a two-year-old beneficiary, I often go to the Illinois Bright Start Investments website, and it would be 90% growth and only 10% fixed income. Because if you're going to put all of your money in safe bank products or treasury bills, you're going to get a very meager rate of return, and in many years or even decades, you could lose serious ground to inflation. And so you, you tend to want to build up your nest egg for retirement or education in the stock market, which historically does best compared to in the rate of inflation, and then only move into fixed income when you really have to have dependable income. And then once that happens, bond or fixed income investors are very concerned about inflation. Inflation means you have a dollar, you used to be able to buy a dozen eggs, but the price of eggs and everything else is going up, and so now you can only buy 10, or now you can only buy 9. We usually hear economists worrying about inflation because a lot of people have no ability to raise their paycheck, and so with a higher rate of inflation, they're just not going to be able to buy the basic goods. Why would they worry about deflation? Deflation means a general price decline. At first, probably a lot of consumers get excited because now their dollar can buy more than it used to. But the problem is all the companies providing goods and services are getting crushed and they're going to start laying people off and showing losses and so forth. So in order to fight deflation, that's when the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which we'll look at, they're going to have to step in and try to revive the economy. So inflation means a loss of purchasing power. Deflation, you are gaining purchasing power, but across the board the economy is slowing down and you see deflation when we go into a recession or the occasional depression. If the test says what typically causes inflation or deflation, it's what we see here. There's a high demand but a tight supply across the board. When we have a weak demand versus supply, we see deflation. And of course, the price of energy and food is very volatile stuff. And so there's inflation, and then there's core inflation. And core inflation uh, ignores food and energy because of the seasonal fluctuations or just there could be a weather event or an oil spill. But in the energy market right now, uh, we see very weak demand versus a high supply for natural gas. And also pretty much for uh, crude oil, although crude oil has started to come back because when nations start to cut production, then the supply starts to shrink too. But when we suddenly find all of this natural gas and oil being produced by fracking uh, with, with relatively weak demand, that's why we've seen the price of oil and natural gas plummet. All right, so fixed income investors, uh, especially if they've just retired and they've got maybe 25 years ahead, it, it's, a, it's, a tr it's a tricky dance because you don't want to have volatility in your investments. But if you're not keeping up with inflation, you know, you're going to have to keep doing without and doing without, which isn't really what anybody wants to plan for. If you are a fixed income investor, you start to look at interest rates differently. If you're a consumer taking out a credit card or looking for a mortgage, you like to hear that interest rates are low. In fact, that's how the Fed stimulates the economy. They artificially make interest rates lower than they would be 
to try to stimulate people's ability to buy a house or to take out a loan and buy a car. However, when you start to put money in to work for you as an investor or a saver, obviously the higher the interest rate, the better. You know, right now as we study, interest rates are still fairly low. And that's good news if you're a consumer, but if you're a fixed income investor in retirement, the last several years have been pretty rough. You know, you've got this annuity, but it's only paying 1%. Or you've got these safe treasury notes, but they're just paying maybe 2.5%. You know, your plan was to get maybe 5% interest in retirement. Uh, when the Fed steps in to cut interest rates, that really can hurt people because usually in retirement, most of your concentration is going to be in the fixed income. A yield curve, what does this mean? And you know, I think some people are trying to study the Series 7 just as if, you know, I memorized this particular slide here so I'm good to go. But this slide here is designed to teach you the content in a way that you can picture it and in a way that you can remember the definition because you never know exactly what your question is going to look like at the test. It could just be which of the following is true about a yield curve or it could go the other way. A graph that shows various maturities of similar credit quality or they could go the other way. They, they really have a big variety of ways of asking these questions. So I don't want you to think that your job is simply to memorize every screen. You want to use these screens to then also think back on what you read in the book and, and also when you do our practice questions we'll be coming at this stuff from many different angles so that you'll be ready for the Series 7. But the Series 7 is not just about a lot of memorization. You know, I know what the yield curve is versus the yield spread. Okay, the question could go there or, or not. You know, But first the definition and the concept. What are we looking at? Well, kind of the opposite of what you'd be looking at if you were taking out a mortgage. Should we take out a short-term mortgage, more of a 15-year, or should we just do a 30-year? Well, what's the difference? You know? Well, the shorter the term, the lower the interest rate. And the longer the term, the higher the interest rate we're going to pay. Well, that makes sense. Okay. So here, we're not, we're not looking to borrow we're actually looking to make some money by lending to the federal government, which is pretty wild. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of jokes and there are a lot of political opinions about the federal government, but don't misunderstand. Uh, this is not only safe, but this is the first level of safety in the entire world of investing. So if you're worried about a T-bill, that means you're apparently worried about having a $100 bill. Th those are just promises backed up by the United States Treasury. There's nothing safer than these. So similar credit quality, yeah, there's no default risk. The only difference is the term to maturity. Maybe right now we're only getting about a 1% yield on T-bills, and on the two-year T-note, maybe it's 2%, and then you get a nice jump maybe at the 10-year T-note, and a little bit higher yield when you go out and get the 30-year T-bond. Uh, as you can see, I'm not much of a graphic artist, but that's not so bad. That's about how it should. It goes up and then it gets pulled to the right. You don't just keep getting infinitely higher and higher yields. But this is saying, okay, how liquid do I need to be? If I want total liquidity or pretty close, I put the money in T-bills and those are often 13 and 26 weeks. So, I mean, why do I need this money any more liquid than 13 or 26 weeks away? I, I don't. This is money beyond my savings account. Uh, and so it, it doesn't really hurt me at all. I'm, the only time I've done it is the executor of an estate. We've got maybe $100,000 that we need to be smart about. We're not going to distribute this for a while. So if it's six months away, I'll park it in T-bills. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, the estate ended up staying open for a while, so I just kept buying T-bills as they matured in either 13 or 26 weeks. Didn't make really high rates of interest, but if you don't have a 10 or a 30 year time horizon, you can't put somebody's money into treasury notes unless they're you know, right at their holding period. But if you have an eight year holding period, you don't buy a 30 year treasury bond, even though it looks like you should. You know, well, I'm an executive in a state, you know, but I wasn't born yesterday. Uh, they were offering 1% on the T-bill and 3.6 on the T-bonds. So I put all of our money in T-bonds. Eh. Well, the problem is if interest rates rise, uh, the market price of the T-bond could plummet 
and you could end up losing money. So there is no default risk on a treasury bill. The, the next risk really comes in as the investor and the advice that he's given. If he didn't understand that T-bonds are securities and that their market price could drop, if somebody didn't explain that to him or if he simply didn't know, that's about the only way you could really get hurt. I mean, if you just, if you're going to hang on to this 10-year treasury note for 10 years, the only thing that hurts you is back to here, inflation. It's like, well, you know, I, I only got a few percentage points, which was a, about just keeping up with inflation or maybe not quite. Yeah, but you're not going to lose your principal. Your interest checks are absolutely coming in. And when the thing matures, you could always buy another one. So as we see, the longer you go out in time, the higher the yield you expect to receive. This is a normal yield curve. Sometimes the yield curve inverts. I don't know if it would go straight down like that, but that would be a, a, an odd situation where I can get almost 4% on a short-term T-bill, but only like 1% on a T-bond. That often happens because interest rates have been high for a long time. Federal Reserve Board, like back, if you've ever heard the name Paul Volcker, you're going, you're going way back now. You're going back to the 80s. But in the early 80s, the Fed shocked the system by raising interest rates so high on the short end that for a while you could get really high yields on T-bills, even higher than you could get on T-notes or T-bonds. It's a situation that doesn't last very long. And these treasuries have been issued since George Washington was in office by Alexander Hamilton, obviously, first treasury secretary. And for about two thirds of our history, the treasuries have always been in a positive yield curve. So this inverted or negative yield curve, it's usually a temporary situation. But yeah, if you see, T-bills are yielding more than the T-notes or the T-bonds, the yield curve is inverted. And I've even seen it where I think yields got up to 5% across the board. Greenspan was raising interest rates, the bond market wasn't really changing, and for a while you had a flat curve, which is an oxymoron. But obviously if the yields are the same, you know, you might as well just put it in T-bills. You're only going to tie your money up in T-bonds when you can get a much higher yield than what you would do here. You know, if I can get 4% on T-bills, I'll just keep doing that as long as that situation exists. So that's the yield curve. I've never seen it any other way than treasuries, but it could be all investment grade munis or all investment grade corporates, however they want to do it. But you have to have the same credit quality so that the only difference is what are the yields based on the terms to maturity? All right, now, terminology in your industry is not like science. Science is great because internationally students can come from wherever and understand what the terms mean, but with the financial world and securities investing, you'll have people talk about what we just looked at here as the yield spread, you know, the spread between here and here. I think the best definition of yield spread is this though yield curve, we're looking at same credit quality, different maturities. Here we're looking at the same maturities and it's kind of like shopping for a higher yield. Is it worth doing? Um, but you know, based on your holding period, should we go with a long term in order to get a much higher yield? Well, how much more could I get? So the yield spread between treasuries and high yield, for example. Maybe on the short-term holdings, you could get an extra 1.5%, which actually would be a lot more than 2. Uh, and at the intermediate term, as you can see, you're getting a much higher yield on the high-yield bonds. And if you have a long time horizon, you could get 3.5% higher if you bought a high yield as opposed to a treasury bond. So how much risk is somebody willing to take? This yield spread shows them how much more of a yield they could get by basically lowering their standards in terms of credit quality. So we could show it between treasuries and junk. That's a very common way to do it. I'm a bond investor. How much safety do I need? You know, uh, maybe, maybe only a percentage of this high yield bond fund would ever default. And over 20 years, maybe I'd be a fool you know, not to try to get a much higher yield. Other people might say, no, I'd be a fool for reaching for that yield. Here, I'm always making lower yields on treasuries, but I sleep really well. You know, when everybody else freaks out about the stock market, 
it really has very little to do with me. Okay. But you know, you'd have to educate your investor. There's a cost to everything in life, and especially in investing. Treasuries give you that feeling of safety, and they are safe. But you're 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 lagging in terms of yield, obviously, because you could be in corporate bonds, and even within there, you could be in high yield. And there's even uh, a high yield fund for municipal bonds in most mutual fund families too. You know, you start thinking of cities like Detroit back before they went bankrupt and you can see why there would be some high yield municipal bonds. All right, so yield curve, same credit quality. How does the yield differ as we go out in time? And then here, if I reached for a little bit higher yield, would I get a lot more return? You know, if the yield spread is very wide, uh, the test may say that that's kind of a negative economic indicator that we're only going to buy high yield bonds if we get a much higher yield and as the yield spread between treasuries and high yield narrows that indicates that bond investors have more confidence in the issuers ability to pay okay now the problem with series 7 is many fold but one of them is the outline is just huge and you should all go to the FINRA website sometime and look at the Series 7 outline. It's massive. And you can't clearly just go through it and say, oh, margin's important, but the strength of the dollar probably isn't. And, and here I'll know about annuities, but I, I think I'll skip over ETFs. That, that's never going to be a way to success in the Series 7. They expect you to be exposed and ready for questions on just about anything on this outline. And some of them, they may go deep, but it's pretty obvious where we have to go deep because there's a big concept here with you know bond yields or options. But it doesn't mean that we just skip over a lot of economic terms because, well, I heard there aren't that many economics questions. Well, the problem is if, if you analyze a group taking the Series 7, nationally, people who pass only pass by a few points. And that's the same for most people who don't pass. They only missed it by a few points. And so it, it, you, you have to be ready for just about anything because if there's a topic that comes up and you're like, I have no idea, you know, there's really no way to get that one right. And pretty soon you've blown five questions just because you figured, well, that probably isn't that important on the test. And no one can afford to give up five questions. Most people, that would be the difference between passing or not today. I got these five right. Over, or, you know, I, I didn't know that they had so many questions on DPPs. So when they were talking about the general partner, I didn't know that. Oh, well, that would, that would be all it would take to take a very bright and otherwise prepared student and make them come back in 30 days. So even though economic factors, it's not as big a focus as options, it still, there are probably five to ten questions that you're going to need to know everything that we talk about today just just in order to have a chance so the strength of the dollar it, it's possible you could take the series seven and not get that question but if you go back to what we've covered it's not like you're, you're going to skip inflation and the yield curve and the yield spread as well it, they pull at random they're not saying we're going to ask everything that you study but we could pull from anything uh, from that outline and that's why you know we have to take our time even through economic factors and by the way everybody feels that margin is a big focus on the seven I don't know why it, it never has been and it still does it still continues to be actually one of the lower things I think you could get more questions on DPPs than margin so you know we obviously will look at it but we're not going to do uh, two hours on margin so the U.S. dollar, you've probably heard in the news, uh, among all the other chattering that goes on, whether the dollar is currently strong or whether it's currently weak. And it does matter, especially uh, if you're an exporter or an importer. Why would the dollar strengthen? Because interest rates are high. Well, relative to other countries, we have higher yields so that people can just park them in the safest place called the treasury bond and get a much higher return. Again, you're not a consumer paying an interest rate, you're an investor. Where could I park my money where it would be safe and give me the highest possible yield? Well, right now, interest rates in the U.S. have been high, and so investors really want to park their money in dollar-denominated securities.
So the demand for dollars goes up and the dollar strengthens. On the other hand, if interest rates are really low here, and that could be because the Fed is really trying to stimulate the economy or trying to help us uh, recover from a banking crisis, if that's the case, okay, well then now investors can't get much of a yield over here. And so the demand for dollar denominated investments drops and so does the value of the dollar. Okay, but who cares? Well, there are going to be effects to having a strong dollar or having a weak dollar. And believe it or not, if you're an investor, you probably want, well, I'm not going to make that statement. Let's just take it case by case. I'm just saying there are many cases where a strong dollar is going to hurt you as an investor or as an American company. And here's one of them. We're a manufacturer. You know, we sell globally. Right now, one of our biggest markets is Japan. But the American dollar has just strengthened compared to the yen. So to all of our Japanese customers, the same nuts and bolts that we're making are too expensive and we're not able to sell to them. So you can see where the test may want to try to exploit that. Strong dollar. I mean, that sounds patriotic and wonderful. It's actually not what we want if we're trying to export. And that could be grain. I don't know if we export a lot of grain to the Japanese, but if we did, if you're a farmer, you don't want the American dollar to strengthen. Well, what if the yen weakens? Well, that's a smart aleck comment. That's the same thing. Now, doing the graphic is always tough, but we have an exchange rate because people trade currencies, e even some retail investors, uh, which is pretty wild. They're just trading these currencies. Okay, well, and if you're an exporter, you need to be trading currencies because you know if the dollar gets really strong, we're not going to be able to export to the Japanese, and they're our biggest customers right now. So whether you want to say the dollar strengthened compared to the yen or the yen weakened, either way, that's going to hurt our exports. If we have a weak dollar, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Sounds embarrassing. But no, suddenly the same nuts and bolts that we export are cheap, and we can export more when the dollar weakens. Well, did the dollar weaken, or did the yen strengthen? Same thing. And so now the temptation is, okay, I got it. Strong dollar bad, weak dollar good. It's like, no, I'm, you know, you have to be very cautious when you get a test question. We're saying that was an American company. They were exporting to the Japanese. Okay? And so a weak dollar is wonderful. Yeah, but they know you're, you're, you've probably had materials that prepared you for that. So they might ask you on, you know, question 73, Raleigh has a business in New York City, and he imports Japanese automobiles for sale in the American market. And then if you're going to take it as this memorization approach, oh yeah, weak dollar is always good. No, we just said this guy actually wants the dollar to be strong so we can buy a lot more Japanese goods. So we're not saying, you know, just kind of sleepily memorize this stuff. If you, if you are an American exporting to the Japanese, a strong dollar hurts. But my little question, which is what I'm always expecting, where's the little curveball at the test. Oh, oh, you're saying Raleigh imports Japanese automobiles for sale here. He imports Subarus or Nissans or Toyotas, what have you. Well, then a strong dollar would be good for him. And the Series 7 is always trying to do that. Okay, we know that you're expecting this, but if you know that much, you should be able to stop yourself and figure out, oh, well, in this case, even though usually the weak dollar is this, the answer here is actually that. In other words, they make you think through it. But yeah, if you're trying to export to the Japanese, weak dollar is what you want. So, you know, I don't know that much about U.S. politics, but you know there are lobbyists representing certain manufacturing associations. They're probably talking to people at Treasury about, hey, if you could just keep the dollar weak another couple years, I think that could really help. You could, you, we could probably hire more people and all that good stuff. All right. So, obviously read it carefully, but understand why a weak dollar would be good for this manufacturing company and why a strong dollar would be bad. What we're talking about there is the balance of trade. Typically, we'd like to be a net exporter. You know, you picture America during the war effort for World War II. Everybody's rolling up their sleeves and the production is huge at GM and Ford and it's just nothing but an expanding economy. We export more than we import, that means we employ a lot of Americans and you know, the economy tends to do well. So 
if we have a trade surplus, that's typically what we want. And that means that we're exporting more than we're importing. We just saw that one way that the federal government could help that is if they kept the dollar weak. Trade deficit means we're currently importing more than we're exporting, as we often do for oil. Although that's gotten to be about 50-50, which is weird. It's like, well, why don't we just keep it all then? You know, well, you know, economics is, is never quite that simple. But it does seem weird that we would import about 50% and export about 50. In any case, if we're importing more than we export, that's a trade deficit. And so that could be made worse or exacerbated. The test will use some vocabulary terms like exacerbated. But a strong dollar would make that worse. Or your question say, well, how could the federal government help to swing a trade deficit back to a trade surplus? A weak dollar. You know? And how do we get a weak dollar? We keep interest rates nice and low so that, like the Saudi families, have no incentive to park bazillions into U.S. Treasury bonds. Welcome to class one for Pass the Sevens test taking skills. At this point you may have read the book and started doing some practice questions or watching some video. What we're trying to get people to understand is you don't learn everything from reading a book and then go test yourself. You learn the basics, you get comfortable with the concepts and the vocabulary by reading our book, but you're going to learn through the practice questions as you can see here. And when the test takes a question that could be presented as very basic and decides, okay, this is one of the hard questions that you have to do, these are five ways that they can end up doing that. Tricky meaning they're going to set you up. They know how they're misleading you, almost like a magician or a hustler. Chatty. We're going to give you a lot of numbers. Maybe one of them's extra. It's not always clear. Could be a lot of words so that you read the first two sentences and then the question kind of goes somewhere else. They are testing your reading skills. Needlessly negative, we have to get used to that. And those aren't always clearly negative words. It could be an investor who wants this should avoid or which of the following is least likely or least suitable. To me the most dangerous one is number four because with tricky, as long as you considered all four answer choices, you really can't fall for the trap. And chatty, you can see, this is a long question. I might even mark this for review. The negative is pretty obvious. But with falsely familiar, there's no way to see it until you really dig in. And number four involves fixing a bad habit for a lot of people. In college especially, most of the tests were based on memorization, and they were very familiar. Well. Here, the fact that an answer choice is familiar or partly familiar could be a trap. And the fact that this other answer choice seems very odd, I've never seen it before, that doesn't mean that you can eliminate it just for that reason. They'll come up with definitions that aren't standard just to see if you can figure out, well, the other three answer choices don't work, and so this one does. So for falsely familiar, if you see, you know, well, the 12B1, I remember reading something about that, so maybe that's close enough. That is always a dangerous assumption. You have to really read carefully. And then for the Roman numeral format, what the test calls multiple, multiple, it's usually phrased as which two of the following? So for the Series 7, for example, with options, which two of the following are in a position to sell stock? Or which of the following will benefit if the price of ABC drops? person who has long calls, long puts, short call, short puts. Those will be the first you know, 25, 30 questions that you get to kind of warm up. And then when they want to make things more difficult, they use any of these. And they often use combinations. It's a Roman numeral format, but it's also using negative words or it could be chatty. So instead of just reading a book or even blasting through 100 questions, what we're going to do is start learning from the questions but also learning how to deal with any question. So I will give the live audience about 25 seconds or so for each one. And if you're watching the recording, to get the full interactive experience, I would pause, do the question, and then hit play. So let me pause this recording. So as you may already know, the Series 7 is not a math test. There are some mathematical concepts. and a lot of that is just if this goes up, this goes down, you know, and by this amount, it's not 
going to lend itself to that familiarity that a math test was. And I didn't go beyond high school math, but we had a very intense teacher who took it to what seemed like almost like a college level. And once you learn those formulas, you went in to take the exam. I, I always had almost 100% confidence because I've already done this formula. Whatever numbers you put in there, I'm just going to plug them in and get it right. When you get to the Series 7, and this is partly why we're starting out with suitability. Suitability isn't 2 times 3 plus 4 equals 10, you know. It's, I don't know what the right answer is just from reading the question. No. It's also the case that even though we've provided a lot of suitability questions for you, what you actually get at the test could still be quite different. But you can still get to the point. Uh, where you're saying, all right, well, if this is a recommendation, first of all, I don't need any more facts than what they've given me. Some people think, well, I can't make a recommendation. I don't know what the wife, eh, eh. if there's no wife in the question, don't go there. But it's more of a negative act. Actually, I'm going to convince you that all questions make your goal, eliminating three answer choices. But with suitability, a lot of them are going to be, well, that partly addresses it, but I don't know why I would recommend a municipal bond if they didn't say anything about the tax bracket. So you have to be very analytical here. We're going to look for things that either completely don't work or kind of work. Now, what we're seeing here, though, is it's not just, you know, Marge and Milton want this. What do you recommend? I'm starting out with the Finner rules. And they got a lot trickier recently. They came up with three different suitability obligations. Okay, reasonable basis is one of them. It's, I think it's the first one. An agent recommending a small cap growth fund to an investor seeking income and capital preservation. Well, I let's say I'm not sure which of the three types of suitability there are here, but small cap growth when you're looking for income and preservation, it's just, well, you're not meeting any suitability there. That's just wrong. All right, so that's what makes this test tricky. You know, it's like, well, you're not meeting suitability, period. Reasonable basis, let's see. An agent recommends municipal bonds to an investor seeking tax-exempt income in your 401k. Ooh, like I said, a lot of answer choices are right, right up to the point where they're wrong. Yeah, oh, municipal bonds, right, tax-exempt income, everything's good. A lot of people are too much of a hurry. In her 401k, ooh, well, maybe you know that, well, there is this Roth 401k, so I'm going to put that to the side. Yeah, a lot of people would have just crossed it out. And a, So A and B are just, well, I don't know if it's reasonable basis or the other one. I think there's even a quantitative. But for A and B, it's just that doesn't work, no matter what type of suitability it is. All right, so we're processing the question. A lot of you are like, well, I should already know the answer. I should have studied so hard. No, you're ready to take on the Series 7 when you get there, and it's going to be like this. An agent recommending a small cap growth fund to an investor seeking capital appreciation. Well, at least that's a good recommendation. An agent studying a prospectus for a variable annuity carefully to understand its features. Wow. The reason this is tricky is that if you're a really good test taker and you really know this material, you got rid of A and B. You're like, no, it, it, they didn't say the Roth 401k. That's the exception. I'm not going to go out there if they didn't throw it in. So A and B don't work. So then we're serving up a pattern, right? All of a sudden C works. There you go. Now the agent recommends a small cap growth fund to an investor seeking capital appreciation, which is good. Yes, but... That would be different from the reasonable basis suitability. Reasonable basis means you know enough about the risk, reward, and features to then go sell it. This is the custom. C is a good recommendation, but it's not the reasonable basis. It's the uh, customer specific. Okay, now based on what I know about you, Mrs. Williams and Mr. Williams, here's what I think you should do. But before I do that, I have to have a reasonable basis to think that this could be suitable to anyone, meaning that the firm and also this particular agent know enough about it. So if you kind of know about bonds and you don't know anything about stocks, you better do some homework. All right, so 
that shows how brutal it can be. We're used to a test that's just A is a bad recommendation, B is a bad recommendation, okay I got a good one with C, I don't even have to worry about D. Yeah. That's how tricky this is. Anyway, so there's a customer specific obligation which is what C is meeting. But D, which you know it's like well that kind of stands out, it's, it's not even talking about a particular customer. No, but if you know the FINRA rule, you know that step one, do you have a reasonable basis to think this could be suitable for anyone and do you know anything about the product? Now, C, you're meeting customer specific. Anyway, that just shows you how hard this test can play on some test questions. All right, I'll give you some time. Just testing the pen. <clears throat> customer has low liquidity needs. Monthly income addresses her uncertainty over the direction of interest rates. One, two, three. She should probably invest in which of the following? See, that's where it could really get nasty if they also combine the negative. She should avoid which of the following. Whoa. But what, what's nice is when they give you three facts, it's like the three... No, you guys aren't studying for the 65. Never mind the three-prong test. That's for investment advisors. But if there are three facts, if any one of these fails, okay, we can use that. Uh, I have low liquidity needs. Well, okay. Uh, that doesn't really help me. Okay, problem solving. What about two? Oh, I need monthly income. Monthly income. T notes would be a no. They pay every six months. U.S. Treasury bills, they're short term, but they don't pay any income. Wow. So Jeannie May and CMOs could pay monthly. Well, yeah, they're based on mortgages or mortgage-backed securities, and we make monthly house payments. Well, which one addresses her uncertainty over the direction of interest rates? Okay, now this is where it's tough. This is where people will often kind of read the statement. They don't read like lawyers. They just read like they're zipping through a newspaper. Oh, uncertainty, so I figure she's nervous, and Ginny Mae is guaranteed by the government. See, when I write a hard question, I always want to give you a false path like that. Well, if, if you just say uncertainty, maybe that means... It says, her uncertainty over the direction of interest rates. Oh, well, even though Ginny Mae is guaranteed... The CMO will allow you to buy particular tranches that can shield you from some of that risk. So that's the answer. Wow. But you see, with a suitability question like this, it, you'll never get to the point where you read four lines and then, oh, I know the answer to this. No, it's not like that. This isn't like... You know, in Spanish, if I'm taking a test, I know that word. It's called el pared. That's, there might be one other synonym for wall, but that's it. Here, okay, based on this, what can I eliminate? Well, five-year treasury notes don't pay monthly, and treasury bills don't pay interest. And, yeah, there's uncertainty, but it says uncertainty over the direction of interest rates. you got to say, what could that mean? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with default, so you don't need to lean towards Ginny Mae anymore. And with the CMO... You can buy uh, the various, what are they, planned amortization class, targeted amortization class. You know, there's a companion bond created so they can reduce some of those risks, whether it's prepayment or extension. So what do we see already? That the answer that first jumps out at you as being correct can be very dangerous. You know, we set up a false pattern where A and B are bad recommendations, and then C is a good recommendation, but it still doesn't answer the question. And then what? Here, you got the word uncertainty in there. So we've given you Ginny Mae treasury notes and treasury bills. Like, it's got to be one of these three. Mm, not necessarily. In fact, it turned out not to be. So you never want to jump to a conclusion. Unless it's just basic math, you know, you bought a, an August 50, call it two, you know, often you just, you've done enough of these, you know what the answer is. But with something like this, and this is why we started with suitability, it's somewhat subjective, you always feel like you'd like to know more about this, but, and, and, inst and instead of, oh, I read this and I know the answer, it's, well, I got to use these facts 
to get rid of three answers. And there's nothing crazy about, you know, five-year T-notes, treasury bills. It's just, well, but it says monthly income. And so who doesn't have monthly income? You've got to be very patient to do this. That's why they give you so much time. You know, you've got well over a minute per question. For the rest of the Series 7 video lessons and test-taking strategy sessions, visit www.examzone.com.